Okay, I think we'll, we'll begin now. Welcome everyone to Tradition and Revolution, the story of the founding of Beis Yaakov and the Beis Yaakov movement. This is part one, and I'm very excited to share this topic with you. Tonight, we'll set the scene for the founding of Beis Yaakov. And what was the, the revolutionary um, effect that Sara Schneer had in her movement? And to understand that, we have to really understand the context and the situation that was in Europe and in the Jewish community at large. I would invite everyone to, uh, to turn their videos on if they're able to. I think it adds a lot to the shield. I understand if they're not able to, but, um, but I would love to see everyone's faces. So welcome everyone and, uh, and let's begin. There's a story told that Rav Yecheskel Sarna, the great Rosh Hashiva and Yeshiva of Hebron was once at a bris and many very well-known and legendary figures were at this bris including the grandson of the Ger Rebbe, the grandson of the Altar of Slabodka, who we spoke about in our previous um, series on Musser, the grandson of the Altar of Navardic, the, grand, the great grandson of the Chavetz Chaim. There were many, many important figures at this bris. And Rav Cheskel Sarna got up. And he said to every, everyone in the room thinks that their grandfather did the most for Kla Yisrael, for the Jewish people. And I want to tell you that no one here did the most for Klai Yisrael. And people were very taken. What is Rav Yecheskel saying? People said, don't start up. Don't start a whole a whole, a whole uh, dispute over here. Just get down. Don't start up with anyone. People said, quiet down, quiet down. And then he added, and Rav Yecheskel did not stop. And he said, I'll tell you one other thing. Once I tell you who this person's name is, every single person here is going to agree with me. Everyone was shocked, outrageous. How could this be? And then he said, I'll add one more thing. This person never studied a black Gemara in their life. And after he said the name, he said, the name that I have that I want to share with you is Sarashnir. Sarashnir. And everyone agreed. Everyone at the, this bris I'm not sure why it was at a bris, why it was, that was a very important thing that he wanted to share. I'm sure there was a context there. And they all agreed. And the entire Jewish world would look completely different had Sarashnir not created this revolution. And I, I'll talk to you more about this as we develop this revolution. Complete uh, new movement, possibly the most important movement in the Jewish community of the 20th century. Now, I'm sure some may say the story, you know, she did study Gemara, perhaps. That, that's, that, I can't prove one or the other. It seems when the scholarship, she did have at least access to, to some text in the Yiddish translation, and, and she was a very learned woman. So I'm, whether she did or did not study Gemara, that, that's not my point. Um, we can discuss women learning Gemara, uh, perhaps, if we have time for the general discussion about women's learning. And, and we, I, I want to spend some time on that. But I want to tell you the story and why it was so important, why everyone at this bris, everyone from across the spectrum agrees that Sarashnir did more for Klai Yisrael than all these very well established, you know, I would say um, household names, the Chavetz Chaim, and we'll talk about the Chavetz Chaim support of the movement, but, but Sarashnir as an individual did perhaps more it's hard to really, you know, hindsight is 2020, but she changed the face of the Torah world. And I want to talk about what the community was going through. What, what were the, the uh, challenges that, that, that Beis Yaakov and Sarah Shneer in particular, were, were they facing? And what was the community like at that time? So now that we, now that most of the people are, are here, I'm going to put the source sheet in the chat. And that way you can follow along and part of, you know, part of the time I'm going to share my screen, part of the time I won't, but here is the source sheet that you can have. If you click on the, the link in the chat, you should be able to, to, to download it and you can have it for yourself. 
So I'm going to share my screen now anyways. That way we can look at this together. So I'll go up to the top here. So this picture is a very well-known picture. It actually is the front cover of the book that I am primarily using. Um, I'll tell you some of my sources before we get going. It's a, it's a picture, not of Sarah Schneer, but it is a picture of the Beis Yaakov Seminary in Rabka in 1929, their summer training program. And as you can see, it's a, you know, the girls are listening very intently. It's a very powerful scene in the, in the country in, in Poland. And, um, and this is some of the materials that I have, um, have been using. Can you um, make it bigger? Yeah, I'll make, I'll make it bigger. So first of all, um, here, I'll just, I'll show you some of the books here I have with me. First of all, this is a new book, um, Naomi Simon's book. She actually lives in Toronto and uh, we hope to have a conversation with her. That's a called the Sarashnir and the Beisakov Movement. This is a classic book, Carry Me in Your Heart. That's a book that I've utilized. Many people know about that. Um, this is a book about Rabbi Tzvichna Kaplan, which we'll talk about her founding of the Beisakov Movement in America. And back to some of my materials here, um, there are multiple articles that I have used. Um, Rachel Man uh, Manikin and her husband have an important article that they wrote together. She also has a work that just came out a few years ago. I didn't get access to all of it, but I saw a review of it called The Rebellion of the Daughters. Um, Naomi Seidman has an entire archive, the Beis Yaakov Project, which she has artifacts, pictures, and records, and maps. And so I utilize that a lot. Rabbi Ruben Brand has had a shear on Wayu Torah that has a source sheet I utilized. And um, a good friend of mine, Yehuda Geber, who is the host of the Jewish History Soundbites podcast, did a series on this. And he is a historian, lecturer, and tour guide. And um, so I use some of his materials as well. Feel free anytime to jump in. Um, this is, you know, my goal is to just sort of uh, create as much interaction as, as people want. And this is really um, an exploration. Um, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this because there are, there's a lot of sort of popular knowledge and then there's the scholarship and- um, This is the one I meant to put out. I would love to hear everyone's, you know, a lot of, I never went to a base Yaakov, disclaimer. Um, so I would love to hear everyone's thoughts if anyone has to offer. So. This first source that I just read this story for, for you, that was in the introduction to Carry Him in Your Heart by Rabbi Noach Weinberg. So that is what we just read. And I would like to show you this picture. This is a picture of the 1903 rabbinical conference in Krakow. Um, so in the, the same year as the Sixth Zionist Congress in Basel, 1903, where Theodore Herzl presented the famous Uganda plan, which became very hotly debated. In another part of Europe, there was another less famous convention, but not any less important. And it was called together by a rabbi by the name of Rabbi, um, uh, rabbi oh, he, he, the Ashkenazic rabbi of Cairo, Rabbi Aaron Mendel HaKohen. Rabbi Aaron Mendel HaKohen um, is pictured up to the top left over here. And he felt very important that everybody meet together in Krakow to, to you know, devote their time as, and to, uh, it was really a new idea. This idea of a conference had not been done before in this, in this framework in modern times. And he, he felt that the issues of the day needed to be confronted. Modernity, assimilation, secularization, new education laws, which we'll talk about, and different political changes. And he felt we need to get together. We need to have a conference. And there was pushback. There was pushback by Rabbanim that didn't want to come. They were pushed back by people who didn't feel they wanted to be, you know, uh, they could be outvoted. It was, it, was, it was controversial even to call the meeting. And at this conference, they were discussing education and the need for, a, um, you know, um, reform in the cheder system, which was in definite need of reform. And all of a sudden, girls' education comes on the agenda. And this is, this is why this conference is very important. A rabbi by the name of Rav Menachem Mendel Chaim Landau. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it's a little bit hard to read over here. 
uh, I believe he is the bottom middle over here. I think that is, um, I'm not sure. When, I'm not sure which one he is. But in any case, he was the rabbi of, of North uh, uh, the Dwar. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. It's a small town in Poland, Noe Dwar. And he talked and he openly apologized. He said, I'm sorry to bring this up. It's a very difficult topic, but our Jewish girls are leaving the fold. And he brought up, he, he, there are many references um, to certain issues that we will talk about, or, which are difficult to really uh, wrap our heads around, but there were, there were tens and you know, we got hundreds of girls that were going to public schools, that were actually sent to Catholic schools. And we're, we'll talk about some of the girls who didn't have any access to education. And Rabbi Lando got up and he said, I think we should create Talmud Torahs for girls. And this created a whole stir. And Rav Aki, uh, Aliyo Akiv Rabinovich, a well-known and dynamic leader at the time, he said, it's impossible. It will never happen. It's, it is forbidden. Women learning Torah, it's never been done. It will not happen. And this, this conference, although it's an important historical um, event, was pretty much a failure. They didn't, they definitely talked about the issues. They did not come to any particular resolution. And the, the, the agenda that was raised about women's education, women's Torah learning was pretty much, um, there was no implementation of that, of that particular um, agenda. However, it did get the ball, the, the ball rolling and it did in a sense bring the attention of the rabbinate, and it also created the potential for an orthodox political movement. So why did Rabbi Landau, why did he feel the need to bring up this issue? What was he talking about where he apologizes? He apologizes for bringing up this difficult, painful issue. What, what painful issue was he talking about? So we have to back up a step and understand what, what time period we're, we're, we're living in and what's going on. We're in the age of isms. We're in the age of of, you know, after the French Revolution, it's the time of, of upheaval, the Enlightenment, and in Galicia, which that's where the Basiakov movement really begins in Poland, where we are, you know, in the 19th century, we're living at a time in that period where they were beginning the uh, laws of equality and rights were starting to be given. And there was something you know, within that framework called the compulsory education law. Now the compulsory education law of 1869, it was, you know, in, I guess you could say was involved with granting uh, equal rights to people. But at the end of the day, the, 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 the uh, practical ramifications that it had on the Jewish community were, were huge. So what happened was, in similar to the public school system today in, in different countries, you had a requirement to educate your child. And that had not been the case beforehand. And this was in, happening in Hungary and in Galicia and diff, uh, different areas. And this law was passed. And all of a sudden, all the boys and the girls were uh, obligated to go to public school. So these traditional, more conservative uh, you know, elements in the community were, would have none of it. We're not going to send our boys to the public schools. We need to give them their Torah education. We need to teach them. So what happened was the, the, these communities were sending their girls in math to public schools in order to save their boys. What do I mean? Because there were certain quotas and certain numbers. If you flood the schools and there's no room left for the girls, or for the boys, then they were free to go to the Chadarm and free to go to the yeshivas. So what happened was all these communities had a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, of change that was going on for these in these decades that came after 1869, where you had all the boys still going to these traditional chadarim, but the girls were going to public schools. And some Hasidish families actually prefer the Catholic schools because the Catholic schools, although they're learning about you know, uh, other religions, but at least they were still all girls. They were not Kohen. So pushing this even further, you know, in, even further, the Gera Rebbe is, is quoted in, uh, in, 
as saying that he had many, many students, thousands of, of, of Gera Hasidim, but he had no matches for them, no Shidduchim. We have a, a, a modern day Shidduch crisis. However, the opposite. In, in nowadays, we have seemingly many uh, eligible girls without, the, you know, for some reason, the boys seem to be on a low, you know, not as, not as many to uh, bachelors. And that, in, the, in those uh, communities, there were not as many girls because all the girls were going to public school. They were meeting, you know, different boys. They were becoming much more polarized, I guess is the word, po uh, not polarized, polarized, polarized is probably the word. They were becoming part of the culture. They, many of them did not know Hebrew. They learned Polish. Some of them didn't even know Yiddish and they were much, um, much more acculturated, much more assimilated. And the thought, the thinking was, well, once they get to the chuppah, then already they'll become a rebbitzin. But all of a sudden, they have these arranged marriages. The parents are living in the old world before the Enlightenment. They they, they arrange this marriage with a chut with a you know any you know there are many different Hasidic sects, but Ger was the largest. Alexander was another one, and they you know Bells was another one, and they they or you know prearrange this marriage. They get to the chuppah and they say, "I'm not interested in marrying this archaic you know you know prosaic guy. I don't, I'm not interested. He's a, he's a nebuch." I, 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 I read philosophy, I read literature, I'm, I'm, I like dance and theater. And this guy is, you know, all he knows is, is you know, is the cheder world. So what happens because of these changes, um, and this is part of the, part of what um, Rabbi Landa was apologizing for, and I also would like to just warn you, this is, this is um, shocking. I have to admit, it's shocking to hear about this, but it seems to be, a, you know, documented in a couple of sources, which we can go through together. Um, Shoal Stampfler, who is a from a historian, who I actually spoke with Rabbi Mordechai Willig last night, and he said, if Shoal Stampfler says it, then I believe it. He's a very hush of a historian. And he documents an issue of human trafficking and prostitution. That what, what was going on at the time, and and we, we, we hear murmurings of this in the sources and the traditional stories of women going off the derech and people leaving the fold. But it wasn't just that they were leaving the fold. There were people who were stuck in, or, in, in arranged marriages. They felt they had no way out and they would run away from home. They would run away. They would join a convent, a Catholic convent at times. Sometimes they got unfortunately involved in prostitution in other in other ways that they would try to... Um, extricate themselves from th these situations. They had no financial, you know, um, uh, they were very poverty stricken and they had no uh, financial means of their own. They, and they were trying to basically leave their communities. And unfortunately, sometimes unbeknownst to them, they would get involved or they would be offered to, um, you know, to get to, they had a, you know, uh, this wealthy man in, in America and there were people who would, you know, ret the shidduch, they would suggest a match, and then they would, they would all of a sudden take them off and say they need to, you know, they need to meet this man, and they would really, you know, get them involved in these terrible, you know, human trafficking issues, and, 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 and it wasn't only just kidnapping, it was also people who were choosing this way of, of life. So I'll just give you one story, which was a very prominent story. Obviously, we're not talking about this, uh, you know, it was... Upon, on the on the fringes of, the, of what was happening, it wasn't like in every every area, and it wasn't you know, it wasn't out of control. I mean, I, I, how could we get called out of control? It was. It's a terrible issue. It's a terrible issue, and any one case is a, is a terrible issue. But I, I, it seems to be it was more on the fringes of the community. However, there was one case that went very. Uh, we would say today it went viral. In those days, it was in the press. It was a, a, a girl by the name of, of Anna Kluger. So Anna Kluger was born to a Hasidic home. She was actually a great granddaughter of the Divrei Chaim. Um, she was a Halberstam. So she was come from, you know, aristocracy, 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 aristocracy. And, and she was, came from a very wealthy family. And like many of those families, she, they, the family sent her to public school. <coughs> That was what that was the normal thing to do in those days, um, and she decided that um, the arranged marriage that her parents organized for her wasn't uh, she wasn't interested. 
So what she does is she leaves the community and she had actually seemingly some more financial means here. So she wasn't stuck like other women were. And she decided she's going to sue her parents for preventing her from furthering her education and make them pay for her um, furthering her education. In fact, she goes to uh, go on to become, uh, you know, to get a PhD in Polish history. And why it made the press is because you have this, this, this woman suing her family, coming from a Hasidic home, and she's trying to get an education. And as you can imagine, that made uh, a lot of people very happy, very upset. You know, it was a, it was a very hot topic and it, it made its rounds uh, it made its rounds in the community. Um, so let's look at a couple sources just to get a sense of, you know, beyond these issues of, um, uh, you know, beyond just leaving the fold, like I mentioned to you, um, the different people that were, go the, the different important factors and the different issues that were facing the community. So I want to talk to you a little bit about a woman by the name of Bertha Pappenheim or Bertha Pappenheim. I think that she probably pronounced it as Bertha. So I'll share my screen with you. And um, so here is Bertha Pappenheim. Has anyone ever heard of, of her? No, no one's heard of her. Okay. You may have heard of this name though. Have you heard of Anna O? Anna O is, was the famous, um, one of the case studies that Josef Breuer um, studies in his work, studies on hysteria. And he was a colleague of Sigmund Freud. And Bertha Pappenheim, who later becomes known that she was actually Anna O. So she suffered from very, um, um, you know, acute forms of hysteria. She, what they call hysteria in those days, which it sounds silly, but they did believe it had something to do with the woman's uterus and it influenced her brain and, uh, you know, but that, that's seemingly what they believe. But there were things that Breuer and Freud developed that became basically the, the foundations of psychoanalysis. And Anna O was one of the important case studies. Um, really her father passed away when she was quite young. She was a caretaker for her father and she took his death very difficult. And it was very, very, you know, she describes many of her uh, reactions to his death. And it was a very, difficult and um, situation. Now, why do I mention her uh, in this context? Because Bertha Pappenheim was a religious Jew. She was a from Jew. She grew up in, in Germany. And um, she, although she um, did struggle with this period of, of depression or, or, or what we'll call psychosis, she, Baruch Hashem, seemingly got out of it. She was able to handle it and deal with it. And her second period of her life she was devoted to the issues that I was mentioning before. She saw the um, thousands of, of women that were, um, you know, without education. She saw that there were these women who got involved in human trafficking, and she created orphanages and different organizations in Germany. Um, she founded the uh, Jewish Women's Association. She was very active, um, a proto-feminist. She was really working very hard to defend the, uh, you know, the, the women of her time. And in fact, she crosses paths with Sarah Schneer. And she was actually very close with the Beis Yaakov movement. We'll talk about that uh, um, for, you know, later on. Um, and one of the things she does, and it was a really incredible thing that she was, she would go around, she had means, she was from a wealthy family and, um, that's how they could afford to pay for Joseph Breuer's treatment and uh, put, you know, they put her on this um, sanatorium where she would hang around and they would relax. And that's this picture she's photographed at one of her sanatoria retreats where she's wearing sort of a riding outfit for horses. And, um, but um, so she seemed to, she seemed to have, a, you know, enough means to be able to travel and she would go into these, you know, uh, you know, different areas in, in, in Egypt and in, you know, different areas in Europe where she found out there were, you know, people, you know, trafficking slaves and, and, and prostitution. And she would, she was this little, little four foot 10 woman. I mean, she would go into these places and shut them down. And she would, she was a very, you know, I would say heroic figure. And, um, and she got involved in controversy. She was very vocal 
about the issues that were going on and the lack of you know, Torah education for women. And she was, um, you know, she actually visited Galicia, Galicia and she saw the issues that were going on in there. And um, she was involved in sort of documentation and this battle against uh, the prostitution and the human trafficking that was going on. Here is a photograph from 1904 of the first board of one of her organizations. And she is in the first row, second from the left. I think that is her in her older years. Okay. As I mentioned to you, this is the source about the prostitution. So Shaul Stompler writes this, that it was, uh, you know, one of the less savory aspects of Eastern, Euro Eastern European Jewish life. And he writes here that these procurers would often pose as suitors looking for a wife were the key. They preyed on single women who wanted to fulfill traditional roles as wives and mothers. The true intent of the husband or groom was revealed after marriage or after the woman had gone off with a newly found friend who promised marriage. And so often it was not, you know, they weren't actively looking and they were sort of swept up or kidnapped by these people. Um, however, there was a desperation here for women to look for husbands. And they were really, you know, they were really afraid of being left alone and they didn't have any financial ability to provide for themselves. And in many cases, um, they were offered these dowries and they would say that you need to, you know, you know, need to agree fast to it. However, and as Stompler points out over here, prostitution was not simply a result of the disappearance of traditional value, right? It's not just people were not from anymore and they didn't really care. In certain key respects, the opposite was the case. Traditional values remained through traditional patterns of behavior had been abandoned. So in other words, there were, the community sort of had its structure. But people were no longer, you know, buying into it. So you have these women who were not, you know, they didn't connect with their parents. They didn't feel they wanted to, you know, marry these, these, these men that were being, you know, uh, sort of arranged for them. And they really had no way of making, you know, escaping from these situations. And they, they basically, you know, they, they uh, either they would try to run away or, you know, once they had, you know, become part of this whole world, it was very difficult for them to, to return because there was such a stigma against it. Um, so that is a very, you know, it's a, it's a painful thing to think about. It's not something that we yet generally, you know, uh, imagine happened in, 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 you know, in the shtetl in the old days. Um, but that seems to be what the newer, what the newer research is showing. And, um, you know, it seems to be, you know, a very unfortunate and, uh, and, and terrible thing that happened to many, many Jewish women. Um, okay, so not, not only do we have, do we have um, a lack of interest in this old style of, of living, but we also have, as we mentioned, a lack of Jewish education. So not only were, you know, not only were girls and women um, let's say desperate for a way out of this culture, but they also were not even, in, you know, inspired in any way to, to maintain this, this, uh, their, their, their connection to the community. Um, so many, many women who, as I mentioned to you, would end up in these Catholic convents and were sent to public schools, who did not even have the ability to read from a sitter. They didn't have, know how to read Hebrew. So they, they knew Yiddish, some of them. Not all, I mean, we, in those days, about six out of 10 people were literate and women were much lower. So we're talking about a, a literacy uh, you know, percentage that was very low. And they were starting to become more, as I mentioned to you, assimilated. They were exposed to Catholicism. Some of them you know, actually converted. There's a, you know, a, a, a huge number of, um, of cases. And again, I mean, the press, of women who, when they were sent to these convents, they never came home. And they decided to live a Catholic life. And there was a huge crisis. And what Ber Bertha Pappenheim and Sarah Schneer, we'll see later, what they were saying and what Rabbi Lando said in 1903, although that conference failed, what we need to educate our Jewish uh, girls and women. They don't have the basic understanding of what it means to live a Jewish life. They're not inspired. They don't know, you know, what 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 the values are. They don't. They don't. They're not interested. 
And it was really like we think of today, like we have so many children leaving the fold and it's a terrible thing. And I'm not trying to downplay it. But the situation in those times was it was a it was a terrible, terrible time where women were signs for these men. There was there were no from women in the younger generations. People were not interested. So um, that was the situation in Galicia and as I mentioned in Poland, based on these laws of you know, as I mentioned, the uh, you know uh, compulsory education acts and different different laws which caused the, you know, possibly was one of the main factors in causing this ripple effect of many of the girls going to public school. However, there were all, in, in addition to this community, uh, we know that there were other communities um, in Europe, and there are some early precedents that I would like to share with you um, that, you know, for supporting and, um, yeah, exactly, yeah. The good old days were, they, they, I mean, there was positive things, and I don't want to, you know, I guess I should put maybe a disclaimer that this year is a little bit more of a downer, you could say, but we're just, we're setting the scene for what, how Sarah Schneer really incredibly saved the entire Jewish community. So, so don't worry, we, we, we're going to, there is a happy side to the story, but, um, but yes, the good old days had its challenges. I mean, besides for this, we have abject poverty. We have, you know, a low lit literacy a level of literacy. We have, you know, World War One, we're gonna, you know, totally displace everyone. We know World War Two is a huge, you know, destruction. But World War One, everyone had to be, everyone was displaced. You know, people died. It was a, it was also a tremendously, tremendously damaging um, a war, and and very difficult to maintain a traditional framework within a community that had very little means, very little uh, education, and um, even for men, like Shaul Stampa points out, like there's this, there's this picture of. All the men were old, educated. They went to yeshivas, and the girls they didn't know anything. And it was really wasn't so black and white. Like the men also didn't really know that much. The literacy level was very low, and the women actually were had a, a very high um, degree of you know considering that time in, in society a high level of education, but in the secular world, in the secular realm, they were not being educated to, to you know in. in in Torah, they were being educated in the public schools, in the Catholic schools, and that's sort of the the uh, the issue that you could see why the traditional literature would sort of you know sort of step around these type of things. Like you know, the story goes that Sarah Schneer was the seamstress, and people she started seeing the skirts going up. Like there's sort of that um, myth and uh, and that that sort of that legend, but they don't say right straight out what was going on, but literally all around for, for, for decades, not, you know, Sarah Schneer founds Beis Algum in 1917. So in the, eight, in, the eight, in the 19th century, mid 19th century for decades, we're talking about 50, 60, 70 years of this issue without any resolution with women leaving the fold, getting involved in terrible things and some of them converting and uh, you know nothing was done about it. So, um, it, although it does paint a negative picture, um, there was a lot. There was a lot that they were dealing with at the time. Like, and and anyone, you know, I, I don't mean to uh, downplay any one particular issue, but there, that was one issue among many of the challenging issues of those times. And you know, in addition to the Haskalah, in addition to the Enlightenment, in addition to abject poverty and the upheaval during World War One, and so, okay, so the, so the next thing I wanted to just talk about is, uh, yes, there were no, you know, formal opportunities for women to study Torah. However, there were, there were other communities that did already have precedent for women studying Torah, and we'll talk a little bit about the informal um, opportunities as well for women studying Torah. So, again, just giving background on the whole story of Sarah Schneer, it's important to know sort of, you know, some of the uh, precursors. So we have Rabbi Sham Shonfal Hirsch, who is a personal uh, favorite of mine. Um, so he was born in 1808 in Hamburg, Germany. And all the way back in 1836, when he was around, I'm terrible at math, but uh, I guess he was around, uh, you know, uh, 28, or uh, yeah, so 28. And um, he writes a huge work that he entitles Choreb, Maria, Mariah, and he goes to a publisher in Germany, 
And the publisher says, non-Jewish publisher says, um, this is too big. Why don't you write an introduction, see if people are interested, and then you could sort of, uh, you know, sell your, your bigger work. So he listens and he writes the 19 letters. And that's how we have the 19 letters. The 19 letters really was written as a marketing ploy for his major work, Choreb. Why do I mention this? Because in addition to it just being interesting, um, in the title page of the work, Chorev, Rabbi Hirsch writes a very interesting line, and I don't really know how to say, pronounce German, but I'll, I'll do my best. So here is the, so you have this work, which is uh, um, for Ubi Yisrul, I'm not sure what that is, that's Yisrul, and here you have for you, the J is pronounced like Y in German. For Yisrael, Vedente or or Gedente, Jung, Jungling and Junge Freund, Freund, Freund. I'm probably saying it terribly, but here Freund is women, and Junglin is young men. So you have it, this dedication here to young thinking Jewish men and Jewish women, and that was very ahead of the times. Um, this is already back in 1836. And Rav Hirsch, um, he found a school in 1853 called the Real Shul in Frankfurt. So not only does he have this vision of his work, Choreb, which was a very sophisticated Jewish uh, work of Jewish thought, you know, addressing men and women, and he implements this vision into actuality. And he builds a shul in Frankfurt, Germany, and it's called the Real Shul. And the Real Shul really had about four different schools all uh, within one institution. He had an elementary school, which was both for women and for girls and boys. He had a high school for boys and a high school for girls. And he also had a school for the Aus student, for the Eastern European Jews who didn't really fit into the other <coughs> schools within his, within his uh, structure. So all the way in 1853, Rav Hirsch founds a school, gives a formal, traditional uh, um, education for uh, opportunities for women, for girls, really, and, and uh, from the elementary school to the high school. And that was, uh, to my knowledge, in modern times, the first place you have an institutionalized, traditional framework for, Jew, for women learning and Torah study for women. So that's in 1853. And Rav Hirsch writes in, in Chore, this line, and um, it, it does seem somewhat dated, but it is, uh, you know, it's on the map. Jewish women's and Torah studies on the map. He writes the following. No less should Israel's daughters learn the contents of the written law and the duties which they have to perform in their lifetime as daughter and young women, or maybe it's as daughters, as mother and as housewife. I think he's referring to them as, you know, nouns. Um, so yes, he does sort of give them their traditional roles, but he's saying that there's no reason that we should not be teaching our daughters Torah. So it's on the map. Formalizing education for women is on the map in the Jewish community in 1853. Now, as we mentioned, Galicia and Poland and Hungary were way behind, way behind. They were, it, they were dealing with a very different community, much more, um, you know, uh, traditional and there wasn't as much of an upheaval from the Haskala in, in Frankfurt. Rav Hirsch was dealing with a very different community, fighting different battles. And uh, it's hard to judge. I'm, I'm just, but I would just like to note this was an early precedent for uh, the study of women learning Torah. And it's going to be very important um, for the future of the Beis Yaakov movement because we will see that Sarah Shneer is highly influenced, heavily influenced by Rav Shem Shemfal Hirsch and his Torah thought and, um, and his students and his student students. Another source I would like to share with you is a source, um, Or Yisrael. This is source number four. And um, Rav Yisrael Salanter, this is written by Rav Yisrael Salanter as a letter in Vilna. So Vilna, again, is in, in, it, it's in um, uh, Lithuania. So we're not, we're not in Germany anymore. And the, um, you know, scholars date this letter to around the year 1843, 1845. So it's early. And Rav Yisrael writes 
put, you know, again, as I mentioned in the Musser uh, series, I, I, I think I make reference to this, but he's an early source for the encouragement of women studying Torah. Although he does only really encourage Musser, that was really his agenda. So it's not clear to me if this means that he would encourage them to learn other things as well. But, um, but here we have Rabbi Sosalanter uh, in 1845 or 1843 writing uh, a letter encouraging women to study Torah. He writes that Nashim Peturos Mitama Torah, women are exempt from studying Torah. Not to say they can't, but he's saying that they are exempt. However, Lo Kain Limur Alazeb, he's talking about Musr, this study, they are not exempt from it's a Chiyuv Mukaf. It is an, uh, you know, an all encompassing obligation. Every single person is obligated, not one should be uh, exempt. And this is, a, again, a very early source. As opposed to Rav Hirsch, Rav Yisrael does not ever implement it in a formalized, structured way. Um, but again, important to note that you see there was already sort of this awareness, this uh, recognition that we need to inspire um, the 50% of our community, the female uh, Jewish girls and Jewish women. Something also to note, which um, I'm not going to go so much into because I don't... Um, I don't have that much more on, on it than a few a few things, but in the uh, in the school of Chabad Lubavitch, they also were earlier in the in, um, encouraging of women, Torah study for women. The Riyach of Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson, the previous Lubavitch Rebbe, he really um, in the not in the context of really Torah study for women and educational formalization of of opportunities in schools. It's not really what his focus was. The question became. Do uh, women constitute, you know, are they just the wife of this family or this husband or the daughter of so-and-so, but they are not their own chassid, I guess, chassidos, you would say, or perhaps they are their own individual chassidos of the community, of the rebbe, of whoever it was, and the riats, and then much more later, the, 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 the most recent Lubavitch rebbe, Emphasize, emphasize to his community that every single woman is her own chassid of the Rebbe. In other words, they're not just sort of like they're, uh, you, know, uh, you know, this wife of or daughter of or, you know, sister of so-and-so. They had their own standing in the community and, and that was encouraged in their, in their um, communities. Other opportunities for Jewish women and Jewish girls moving back to uh, away from Germany, because as I mentioned, it was a very different community, and we will talk about its influence on Sarshnir. It's very, very important. And uh, in general, the whole Agudas Yisrael movement, which we also will talk about, was very much influenced by the involvement of German Jews and their connection, their partnership with the Ger Rebbe and the Hasidic uh, community. But if we move back to Eastern Europe, Lithuania and in Russia and in Poland, there were other opportunities, less traditional and less formalized, but other opportunities nonetheless for women to study Torah. So we mentioned many women were studying in public schools, right? That was, we, we have this notion like, um, you know, all the people came to America, they, there was mass immigration, and they, um, <laughs> um, okay, that's very similar to the nickname they gave Sarshnir. They called her, um, Hasidke, Hasidko. They call her little Hasidista. Hasidista. So you more, know more Yiddish than me, probably. Hasidista. <laughs> yes. They, they they called her little Miss Hasid or, or yeah, Hasidista. So we'll talk about that also. That that Sarshnir sort of was this very pious and um, almost you know people would, would make fun of it. Um, so uh, but but yes, it seems like we have some 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 educated uh, listeners here. So thank you very much for that. Um, what was I saying? Oh, so if we go back to Eastern Europe and Russia and Poland, there were other opportunities for women to learn Torah. And uh, we mentioned that many women were in, oh, I was saying about in America. People have this notion that they talk about, you know, the, the trade of Medina and people went to America and it was terrible and they all sent their kids to public school and they went off the dare. Oh, while there is truth to that, the reality is that for generations, perhaps the people were going to public school beforehand. This was already something that was plaguing the community 
in the in the mid 19th century. So the, the the notion that you know America you know brought everyone off the derech, yes, it was a challenge because there was a new culture, and yes, it was a challenge because everyone wanted to be America and they were embarrassed of being religious and from. But there were already public schools in Hungary, in Poland, in Russia that that people were going, especially women, in mass. That that so that's a reality that that is just uh, I think sort of you know I guess busting that myth. That uh, public school is the, is the reason why everyone went off to there in America. Um, so we see that they had opportunities to learn outside of the of the Jewish framework, but there were also other things that were going on, although not as formalized. So there was something called it sounds a little strange to even say, but there were chadarim for women. There were chadarim even as early as the 17th, 17th, you know, 16th and 17th centuries. That were these little Talmud Torahs, smaller schools with one teacher, not much, uh, you know, in the ways of uh, extracurriculars and, uh, you know, in student governments or anything like that. But um, they had these little, you know, these little chadarim, and they, and women they often had for girls, just you know, just uh, teaching them Torah, Talmud Torahs, and different things along those lines. Now, as I mentioned to you, the the cheder model was very, very um, decrepit, very. There was not much funding for it. There was, you know, the teachers were not of the highest caliber and there was a much need of reform. And came up, there was a, a movement in Russia that came along and said, we're going to fix the cheder system. And we're going to create something called the cheder mitukan. The cheder mitukan or the cheder mitukan was, and they actually used that for, uh, terminology, even though they were um, early Chovavet Sion followers, but they still had not, you know, moved to the uh, modern Hebrew, and uh, they used, you know, Ashkenaz's pronunciation. So they formed this new cheder, and they would, if you want to translate it as progressive or improved, but they said we were going to make a new cheder. And many of these chadarim were open to women, to girls as well as boys. Either they were co-ed, that was the real cheder mitukan. Or they were just separate, but they had opportunities for girls to learn, and they had a whole program for girls. But they were influenced by the Haskala and by the Chol Beit Zion, and they incorporated ideas like Jewish nationalism. Now, the Tsar, because we're talking about 18th century and 19th century Russia, the Tsar was not a fan of the Cheder Metzukan. He was very upset about this. And the more conservative elements within the community were also not happy about this. We don't want our children learning about Jewish nationalism. We don't want them learning about different secular ideas. So there was a, um, as I mentioned to you, they were using Ashkenaz's pronunciation. So what the critics were saying about the, these chadarim is they're calling it a cheder misukan. It's really a cheder misukan with a samach and not a saf. It's a dangerous cheder. We can't send our kids to that cheder. And they were, um, you know, they spoke negatively against these chadarim. Now, to give you an idea of how Many we you know chadarim I'm talking about um, by 1903 there were close to 1,000 cheder mitukans throughout Russia, and many of them not all of them but many of them had programs for girls. So we're talking about a massive movement. And again, people think that Sarachnir came on the scene and she saw a problem that no one saw, didn't realize, didn't know what to do. It's not the case. There were other alternatives. Maybe they were less traditional, but there were other alternatives that were already happening for years without any, you know, uh, you know, formalized structure um, that was approved by the traditional institutions. However, they were going on at the time, and it was in mass. Um, other schools after World War One, as I mentioned, this huge upheaval of World War One. Now we're in what's called interwar Poland because all the different boundaries and borders became, you know, jumbled up and everything. There were other schools that sprung up. The Tarbut, the Tarbut schools, which I think is translated as culture, culture schools. Um, there were, you know, the, the Zionist schools, the Tarbut, and the Tarbut had co-education. So we had women ob opportunities to learn within a, um, you know, more secular but Jewish environment. The Bundist and the Polizion organizations had the different schools. They had the Sishka schools. And they have the different, you know, thousands of students as well. And both of these uh, schools were co-educational. So we had women learning in those schools. Now, it's debatable how anti-religious Tarbut was and 
and what they were saying that you know, definitely the Zisha, Zisha schools were definitely anti-religious. But at the end of the day, they were educational models for women. Um, there was a very famous school, the Yehudaya or Yehudia school in Warsaw. Um, that was a very wealthy and, and upper class school. Um, and uh, there was a school, and this was, I would say, a forerunner, perhaps, one could argue, for the base outcome movement. There was a school system that already started schools in Tells and in Kovna and in Kelm called the Chavatzele schools or Chavatzele. And th these schools uh, were, as I mentioned to you before, were founded by a few German uh, Yekesha rabbi doctors. And um, we, we'll talk a little bit more about them coming up. But we have Rabbi Dr. Um, Emmanuel Karlbach. Um, and he, along with some of his other colleagues, go and you know, offer what they have already been doing in Germany and Frankfurt for already 40 years. They start you know, influencing the structural, the you know, um, institutional structures in Eastern Europe. And this is the beginning of the offering German solutions, we'll call them Jewish German solutions to Eastern European and Jewish communities. And this is really what much of what happens in the Aguda, what happens in Beis Yaakov, is that there's a, there's a sort of a partnership between what was happening already in German, uh, in Frankfurt and German communities for the Jewish uh, women learning and for the institutional structural um, political movements. So in 1921, there was an, a gymnasium founded, this Chabatzelitz Girls School in, um, in Tels. And there was a direct involvement with Rav Yosef Le Bloch, the Rosh Hashiva of Tels, and they started this school. Um, to show you how important that school was, later when Beis Yaakov had a convention, it was held at the Chavatzela school. If I'm not mistaken, it, it, in, um, in Warsaw, if I'm not mistaken. But it was held, this convention, it was a different institution. Chavatzela was a different institution, but it was a very, uh, it was, a, you know, there was a very important influence and perhaps or even a forerunner for Beis Yaakov. There were also different schools called the Yavne schools, which were in Pelzin and Panovich, again, a little bit more traditional. But none of these schools, although they, you know, there was, as I mentioned, there, you know, hundreds of students, of thousands of schools eventually, they were not um, institutionalized and they certainly were not in the general traditional um, framework of Jewish study. Um, Kavat Seles is pro probably, and Yavne were probably exceptions, but they were not, you know, they were nowhere near the success that we will see that Beis Yaakov had um, at you know, sort of this mass institutional structure that was seamless, you know, it, it, appears, it appears seamless, but I'm sure there were, you know, it, it took a lot of effort, but they, they were very much connected and all the schools had this very similar culture. And we'll talk a lot more about how Sarshnir was so able to be so successful when so many, um, so many institutions were failing and, 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 and so many progressive and anti-religious schools, public schools, Catholic schools were competing for the Jewish girls. How was Sarah Schneer so successful? So that's really, I'll, 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 leave, you all, I'll leave you with that question and um, we'll really answer that question mostly next time. Um, but here you see, just to, guess, to give a, to, a, to cap the entire discussion and to give a sort of a summary of what was going on at the time, so as we mentioned, assimilation, unfortunate prostitution. We have not as many opportunities for women's learning, although there were these other schools that were starting to, you know, to be formed. And there was a lack of, of cohesive rabbinic uh, infrastructure that they didn't come to any solution. They, someone raised this issue and others said, we're not gonna teach the girls Torah, no way. And really, nothing was done about it. Um, we had, you know, vocal um, critics, and I would say, you know, who did some heroic things like Bertha Pappenheim. Um, but again, she doesn't start a school. She doesn't. She was involved, as we'll see, and she was very close with the Beisago movement, and she supported it. But she doesn't herself found this school. And for many years, since the Compulsory Education Act in 1869. I would say for about 50, 60 years, 
the community is sort of, you know, reeling and not sure how, what are we going to do? How can we, what, how are we going to uh, basically marry off our children? How are we going to keep our daughters connected? And we had, you know, these different stories and, 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 and you know, uh, individuals, but it was a general trend of people and and daughters not feeling connected to their parents, not connect, being feeling connected to their religion, and not having many traditional opportunities to study Torah. Um, so I will leave you with that sort of gloom picture. Although, don't forget, we had, you know, thank God our hero Sarah Schneer comes into, uh, you know, onto the scene, and uh, and we'll, we'll we'll pick up with her and her story and how she was inspired and. The controversy and the, and the pushback and her story, God willing, next time. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Um, and uh, we will see you next week. Next week, we'll do it. I think it's going to be on Thursday um, because there is a women's base medrash program on March 1st, I believe, which is the next um, Tuesday night. So I moved my, I don't want to con conflict with that event. So um, we're going to be getting together on Zoom at 8.30 on um, March 4th, it is? Is it Thursday? No. March 4th is Shabbos. Sorry, so March 3rd, I guess. March 3rd, Thursday night, God willing. Sounds good. Thanks for waiting our appetite. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone have a great night.